We're going to pick up our study in Revelation, the seventh vision today, and we're going to start in Luke 19. So y'all turn to Luke 19. <clears throat> Alright, let's go to our Father in prayer before we get started. Father, we thank You once again for the privilege of having fellowship in Your name. Lord, we thank You for making it possible that we might know You. We want to love You. We want to worship You. We want to praise You. And we know that we have so many faults and failures in this respect, Lord. But we do believe that You'll accept our praise and the sacrifice of our lips because they come in the name of Christ who died for us. Lord, we thank You for this incredible privilege. We ask prayer for all those that have asked for prayer. Lord, we put their names up, petitions before you. And uh, Lord, I, so many don't want their names specifically said, but you know who it is that needs you. And we are told to make prayer for all saints. But specifically, I'd like to pray for our sister Jeanette in the Netherlands, Lord, who's uh, having some hard times. And we ask you to please be with her and guide her in what she's going through. And let her never take her eyes off of Christ Jesus our Lord. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'll ask all y'all too to remember Jeanette. She's a lady in the Netherlands, a friend of uh, Yanni's that's uh, she's having some bad medical problems and got got children and it's just so. Okay. Um, for everybody that asked, we had a great trip this week. We had a bunch of good classes. We had just a great group, and we also have a uh, a new engagement. Nathan and uh, Taylan. I know y'all don't know Nathan and Taylan, but Nathan and Taylan. Uh, got engaged while we were there, so we're glad to have that. Look, it's encouraging just to see young people that believe on the Lord. Yeah. It's especially encouraging to see a young man that wants to preach. Um, I put one of his class, I got Lexi to put a class on the YouTube group page. Y'all go check him out. Facebook. Facebook, yeah, sorry, Facebook page. Um, but anyway, and it's incredibly rare to find a 21-year-old 20, believer who wants to preach, who wants a wife who's saved and doesn't care about the other issues first. His first and foremost is, and he found one. And um, her first concern is, how can I help him? So, it, look, it's just a wonderful blessing. And nothing against the other kids. I mean, the other, look, the others all, uh, well, I don't know their girlfriend, but I do know one of them, and he's got him a godly girl too. But it's just real good to be around a young group of people because, I mean, you just don't see many young true believers today. Now, you see a lot of young believers that are caught up in all the modern worship and you know y'all seen all that sort of stuff rock and roll uh night light shows and all that but i'm talking about a man that just wants to preach the gospel and if he keeps preaching like he's preaching they're probably going to show him the door at some churches <laughs> um, how can a 21 year old go in there and preach hey let's all wake up and serve the lord and not offend people but that's what he's doing so y'all pray for him all right, in uh, Luke 19, I just want to pick up today. Now, I went ahead and put this on the board because remember, we're dealing with this thousand years and the final destruction of Satan. And all these years back here in the Old Testament, the kingdom was promised, wasn't it? And the Messiah was promised. And Israel considered that to be the age they were living in, but they were always looking forward to the last days. And the last days were to come with Messiah. Now, the Israelite today who doesn't believe in the Lord is still looking for the last days. He's still looking for the Messiah, isn't he? But when are we told the last days commence? When Christ came. Right. That's why the writer of Hebrews says, God, who in sundry times, back here, here a little, there a little, and in diverse manners, through prophets, through types, through pictures and symbols, in sundry times and diverse manners in time past spake unto the, uh, our fathers by the prophets. He said, He hath in these last days spoken unto us by His Son. Now how did this message come in the last days? Jesus Christ came and started speaking the message Himself, didn't He? Now it took about literally 2,000, well, 1,500 years back here from Abraham until the period of silence, or you could say from Moses down to the cross. But anyway... Back here, the Old Testament was compiled, and little by little, the picture was added to vaguely, wasn't it? But it took all that time to bring that message, didn't it? Then we had a period of 400 years of silence, but how long did it take to get the New Testament message? Folks, in a generation, it was there. In a generation, Christ came and spoke it, His apostles went out and preached it and wrote it, and we've got it, don't we? So, diverse sundry manners back here in the last days made plain, didn't it? But remember this. Who did the message, who was the message revealed to? What people first? The Jews. Yeah. Who were all the all the preachers of it? Jews at first. What was Jesus Christ? A Jew. So then how was the message revealed? 
in Jewish language. That's the point we've got to always remember. The prophets all spoke in Jewish language. I don't mean in Hebrew. I don't mean in language. I mean in types and symbols. So when Jesus Christ came, how did He explain the New Covenant? In the same terms as the Old Covenant. Look, that's why we Gentiles today, way over here, can say that Christ is our Passover. We don't keep a Passover, do we? Why do we even say that? We're referencing what the Passover was back here. It's why we talk about that we need to be sprinkled with the blood. We don't need any blood sprinkled on us, do we? It's Old Testament language. It's Jewish language. What the Old Testament was showing back here by actual sprinkling is the application of the blood of Christ to us over here on our conscience. So it's, it's that Jewish language. The book of Revelation is no different. It's, it's the same kind of Jewish types and symbols. Now, let's start in Luke 19. In Luke 19, 11, it says, As they heard these things, he added and spake a parable, uh, because he was nigh to Jerusalem, and because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. And the word appear here means to discover, right? Now, was the kingdom of God here? Yes. But Jesus Christ said the kingdom's not in you, or the kingdom's not, does it come with observation? The kingdom is in you, didn't it? Matter of fact, look back at, uh, well, no, y'all know the passage. All right? Remember the Jews were looking for the kingdom of God. They were looking for a physical kingdom, weren't they? But what kind of kingdom is it? It's spiritual. So he says, because they thought the kingdom would immediately appear, he said, a certain nobleman, and by the way, the nobleman means the son of a king. A certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. Now the Jews understood this language perfectly because they were under Roman authority and any time they got a king, you know what he had to do? He had to go to Rome and, get, and receive his orders to come back and rule, didn't he? So they understood this. But y'all think of what he's saying here. A certain nobleman. Now who's the nobleman? Christ. Came and then what? Went to receive a kingdom for himself, didn't he? Now, he tells about what his servants are to do while he's gone. But how did Christ receive the kingdom? In what form is the kingdom? And when will the kingdom actually appear? I'm going to come over here. Okay. When Christ comes over here, what's going to appear? Folks, the kingdom of God is going to be seen. The heavens and the earth as they are now are going to be changed, just like they were at the time of the flood. And everything's going to be, be changed. We're told the heavens are going to roll up like a scroll. In other words, the, the spiritual realm is going to be seen again, isn't it? Now, in the Bible, when's the last time everybody on earth could see the spiritual realm? It was way back here in the garden before the fall. If I just put a line back here, didn't Adam live without sin for some time? We don't know how long, but he did live, didn't he? And he walked and talked with God. He saw the angels. He saw, he, he saw the spiritual realm. But as soon as he fell, the kingdom went into a veiled form. We'll put it that way. Now, Christ comes as the king riding on a horse. He came. He, he was, uh, in, he was, the people declared him king. He presented himself. And what did his people say? We'll not have this man rule over us. Right? So they rejected him as king, didn't they? But, did He come to rule over those that rejected Him? No. He knew they were going to reject Him. He came to get the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He came to get His elect. So He goes up into heaven. Now, the kingdom of God, back here, became, I'm going to put, it, it became under attack back here, didn't it? So what did the Father do? The Father sent His Son to reclaim it. Now when the Son comes, the Son gives His life, he performs His work on the cross. And then in resurrection, He ascends up, doesn't He? And He receives the kingdom for Himself. But in what form is it? The old timers would say it's mediatorial kingdom. In other words, can you and I see the kingdom today? No. Where is it, where is it at? It's in our hearts. But is the day coming when it's going to be revealed? So right now it's in this mediatorial form, but it won't always be that way, will it? Now let's start to, to prove a couple of these things. Let's go over to 1 Corinthians 16. Or 15.
Alright, 1 Corinthians 15 now is all about resurrection. Literal, physical resurrection. So in 1 Corinthians 15, 20, we read this. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Now notice he's the first fruits, isn't he? Has Christ risen from the dead? Yeah. And as such, what was he? He was the first fruits. What's the first fruits? The first. Yeah. It's the first. What follows the first fruits? Yes. The harvest. You get the first fruits in first, and then the harvest comes. Done. In other words, the first fruits belong to God. Well, what do we consider the harvest? The harvest is over here. The harvest is the resurrection. Okay? So Christ is the first fruits of resurrection. Who's the only one that has been raised from the dead never to die again? Christ. Jesus Christ. Has Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Their soul and spirit are with the Lord, but they have not received their new bodies. Okay? Even Lazarus was not resurrected like this. Lazarus was resuscitated, but Lazarus died again, didn't he? So then Jesus Christ is the first fruits of the resurrection. First fruits of them that slept. Four, since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. Now that's how resurrection works. Christ first, those that are his at his coming. Then cometh the end. Now up here on the board, where is the end? We'll just put it right here. Here's the end. Okay? I'll just put an X right here. That's the end. He says, Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. Now, what happened to God's kingdom back here? It came under attack. And from that point, it has been uh, it has been dominated on earth by this other kingdom, hasn't it? So then, Jesus Christ came to reclaim the kingdom, and He's got to cleanse it. He's got to perfect it, doesn't He? So right now, can you say that all enemies have yet been put under His feet? No. But will He reign until all enemies are put under His feet? So currently, today, what form is the kingdom in? Believers are on earth. Now, saints in heaven are with Him in, in the kingdom of heaven, right? No new bodies yet, but they're with Him. But on earth, how do you and I go to the Father? Through the Spirit, through the Son, to the Father, right? But is there coming a day when we won't have to go in that same... Yes, there's coming a day when we're going to be with Him, isn't it? Face to face. Face to face. So now He says the kingdom is going to be like this until He has put down all rule and all authority and power, right? Now... In this seventh vision, what are we looking at? What's the bulk of the seventh vision have to do with? The destruction of Satan. Is Satan an enemy of God that must be put down? Yeah. Now, you remember we've got the... I'll just come over here and write the lake of fire. Right? Now, we have already seen the beast, the false prophet. They're in the lake of fire. And I don't mean time-wise. I mean we've already had visions that address their, this. All happens over here. But before that, in the first vision that dealt with destruction, we had those, the men with the mark. Y'all remember what happened to them? They all go in. Babylon. In other words, this is showing us destruction, isn't it? All the enemies of God have been destroyed so far in these visions. Not in chronologically. In the visions, it's been dealing with each one. Who's the last one that's going to be dealt with? Satan. 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 Satan's going to wind up in the same place. Okay, Not in time. It all happens over here. Does that make sense so far? Okay. Now, when he says, verse 25, For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. So who is the final enemy that must be destroyed over here? Yeah. Now look, I'm going to put a line over here. Well, I'm going to put it in a square. The last enemy that must be destroyed is death. Are there any enemies left after death? No. In this vision, we're going to see Satan locked up in the end of that place, aren't we? 
Once Satan is locked away, what's the last enemy Christ deals with? Death. Death. That's last. Can Satan's destruction come after that? No. It's got to come before. For or because He, the Father, hath put all things under His, Christ's feet. But when He saith all things are put under Him, it is manifest that He, the Father, is accepted, which did put all things under Him. And when all things shall be subdued unto Him, then shall the Son also Himself be subject unto Him to put all things under Him, that God may be all in all. Can you all see how the Father sent the Son to clean everything up? So, when everything's finished, the kingdom goes back to that form. Father, Son, the Bride at the Son's right hand. Total righteousness, the kingdom cleansed of all enemies. Everybody get that picture so far? Okay. The last enemy that must be destroyed is death, right? So then who's got to be destroyed before death? Satan. Satan the men with the mark, the beast, the false prophet, and Babylon. Now you'll go over to Revelation 20. Look, I know what I have up here on the board is totally different than what so many people teach in the church today. I understand that. I used to teach it completely different myself. And thank God He began to show me something. Um, and I'm, look, this ain't nothing I've seen. I've never seen anything new. Folks, If you don't ever look for new things in the Bible. If you think you're going to find something new in the Bible, right away you're saying, I'm smarter than all the other men that have lived before me. Any truth you find in the Scripture, you're going to find somebody's already found it before you. And you're going to find out that you generally got to go back about 200 years to, to find people that generally held it because of this, this corruption that's gone into the church. But he says in Revelation 20, this last vision, I just want you all to notice the order. I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. He cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. After that, he must be loosed a little season. Now that's exactly what I've got on the board. Jesus came, bound Satan. He, he, in a certain way, in the providence of God, he took certain powers from him and he could no longer deceive the nations as he had before. So then the nations begin, to, we've got this long period of evangelism where the church goes into the nations and the nations begin to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's a long period. But towards the end, Satan is bound a little season. And during that season, what would you expect to stop? That period of vast evangelism, that period of the church conquering in the world. So during this little season, what will we see? The church is going to look like it's going backwards and being conquered, isn't it? Do you all see that? Mm -hmm. We're seeing it right now, aren't we? Now he says here, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them, not bodies of them, souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads and in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Is Christ reigning right now? Yes. yes. Who's up there with Him? The saints. Not in bodies, but the souls of them. Are they enjoying His reign? Mm -hmm. Folks, they're taking part in it. To say that they're reigning doesn't mean that they're sitting as a judge at a bench over people on the earth. It means they're enjoying His reign, aren't they? Now, He says next, But the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. Can you say that about those that are not saved? Are they with the Lord up there? No. It says, They live... Uh, this is the first resurrection. What is different about those people whose souls are with Christ and those who are not? Those whose souls are with Christ have been raised from the dead spiritually. Have they been, were they once dead in trespasses and sins? Yeah. Have they been quickened? Yeah. That's the first resurrection, he says. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. Now, what is this second death? Literally, it's a second death, isn't it? Now, can the second death... This is the second death right here. Folks, this is it. Does this have any hold over the saints of God? No. So he says, uh, When a thousand years over, they shall go out... Verse uh, seven. seven. 
And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations. Then what power do you think was taken from him? A certain power of deception. Folks, did Satan rule over the nations prior to the cross? For 2,000 years, they, he, they had just all been steeped in His worship and worshiping the sun, the moon, and the stars. God had limited His revelation to one nation, hadn't He? Now, there was a, a, a you know one here and one there, like, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of one. Uh, Ruth, uh, what was her? I forgot her name. Ruth is one, the Moabitess. Um, What's the lady? Rahab. You know, there were a few here and there, right? But for the most part, did God just turn the nations over? Yeah. He did, and He dealt with Israel. But at the cross, that's all changing, isn't it? Now He's about to take that power and go out and evangelize the nations. So He says, verse 8, Satan shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth. Now what does four quarters mean? Uh, all from north, north, south, east, and west. All the world. Gog and Magog, and look, we're going to get into what Gog and Magog are. That's Old Testament language for a people, a huge number of people opposing God's people. That's all it is. Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. Now immediately, what have we been trained to do in our mind? All of a sudden, we start picturing tanks and helicopters, don't we? Are we talking about a physical battle? It's spiritual. He says... They went up on the breadth of the earth. Folks, this doesn't happen on one battlefield. This happens all over the world. And compassed the camp of the saints about. You know what a camp is? A temporary abode. Right. What are we in this world? Pilgrims. How did Abraham live in this world? In a like a tent. In a tent, like a pilgrim. Now, he was in the land God promised him, wasn't he? But what did Abraham recognize about that land? It was a physical representation of spiritual heaven itself. So he says, He went up on the breath of the earth, compassed the camp of the saints about, and the beloved city, and don't make that Jerusalem in the Middle East, this is New Jerusalem, this is the church, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Now, what's going to happen at the second coming? Once Christ is coming in flaming fire, right? So y'all look how simple this fits. Christ came, he binds Satan in a certain manner, and could Satan stop the gospel from going into the world? Y'all realize that about a hundred years after the cross, the gospel went into Europe and began to conquer Europe. It, it spread so fast that Constantine had to do something, didn't he? He had to acknowledge this new thing. It's unreal that it's disappeared the way it has. It, it, it's more it's surprising. Fast. Yeah, you're right, Sully. And the only reason it's disappeared so fast is why? Satan's been loose. Folks, we can see in the last 200 years the reversal of all of this. Look at the, I mean, y'all look at what the revivals all led to. Look at the revival that started with the Reformation. He got his bunch out of, out of, out of the Babylonian captivity of Rome, didn't he? And they went forth into the world. The church starts to settle down, and what happens? Here comes Whitfield and, and uh, Wesley and new revival for what? They started all these training institutions and the gospel went into the new world and it seemed to start dying down again and what? Revival again and then missionaries went out. William Carey, Adoniram and Judson and literally in the 1700s and beginning of the 1800s the gospel went in all kinds of places, didn't it? And it conquered. But has that all started to go backwards? Yeah. When you hear someone today say that they went on a foreign mission trip, what do you generally think? Uh, I think church paid vacation. That's what I always think. I don't mean all of them, but that's generally the opinion. I had a friend that went to Russia on one. And I said, what did y'all do? He said, you know, we worked on a couple schoolhouses and nobody said anything about Jesus Christ. Folks, that's not a gospel trip. It's also not a gospel trip if you go dig wells and tell the people we're digging these for Jesus. What is, the, what is a missionary trip? To preach the gospel of Christ. That's what it's about. Now that's what these missionaries went out and did. But anyway, he says here, Satan's loosed. Fire comes down out of heaven and devours the, the, the opponents of God. Verse 10, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. So in verse 10, do we have the destruction of the devil? Yeah. And the beast and the false prophet, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now that's the destruction of the devil, right? But we're told the last enemy that shall be destroyed is not the devil, it's death. Then when must the destruction of the devil come? 
before death is destroyed. When is death destroyed? In resurrection, folks. What does Christ prove in resurrection? He's got power over death, doesn't He? Now watch how it goes. I saw a great white throne. After Satan is destroyed, Christ comes. What's the next thing He does? Judges. He's going to be resurrection and judgment. I saw a great white throne and Him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was no place found for them. I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God and the books were opened and another book was opened which is the book of life and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Is that resurrection? Yes. Now don't make this some separate judgment. Are all going to be judged according to their works? Yes. Saved and lost. The difference is what it's for. Alright, now he says, verse 13, The sea gave up the dead which were in it, death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. Now watch verse 14. Death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Does the second death do away with death? Yes. So the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death, right? How in the world could we put a thousand years after that and Satan's destruction after that? How can Satan's destruction come after resurrection? But see, by misunderstanding this thousand years, what did that force men to do? They came up with another judgment. They came up with another resurrection. Some of them have come up with three more resurrections. And I'm not picking on anybody. When you, when you misunderstand this and you try and make it physically represent Israel in the Middle East, it's so confusing there's nothing else you can do. You've got to start coming up with these things. But who's the last enemy that shall be destroyed? Death. 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 How after Christ comes could we have any more death? Folks, the second yeah. death does away with the loss and there's no more death. How could we have any more sin? We can't. How could we have a thousand years of sinners living on the earth with a rebellion yet to come after Christ has come? We can. Y'all see how confusing that is? Okay. Go over to Revelation 12 and let's see the same thing. Again, this thing is brought out more prominently in, in chapter 20 because it's the last vision and it's dealing with Satan in the end. That's why the, uh, the picture of heaven is more complete. New Jerusalem, we've got two, the whole chapter and a half covering New Jerusalem why? because it's the final fulfillment of these things. But is this the first time we've seen these things? No, they've been here before. Watch Revelation 12. We've got the same order. Verse 5. She brought forth a man-child, Christ, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to His throne. Now when did that happen? Right here. Caught up to God and to His throne. Is Christ sitting on His throne today? Next it says, The woman, the church, fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. And that three and a half years always has reference to an incomplete period of time. It's the church's time in the wilderness. Now verse 7. There was war in heaven. What's been going on all this time? War in heaven. Folks, we're in a spiritual war, aren't we? There was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels. Now, before the cross, the dragon prevailed in this battle, didn't he? Here it says they prevailed not. Neither was their place found anymore in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. See, there is the deception of him. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. I heard a loud voice saying, In heaven... Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of His Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. So do we see Satan's casting out here? And what's it a result of? Christ's coronation. When Christ rises up and is seated on His throne, what happens with the devil? He's cast out. Now this is not physical. It's not Him being limited. Folks, Satan is a spirit. It's not that he's no longer in the spiritual realm. He is a spirit. Angels are spirits, aren't they? Mm -hmm. So then what we basically are looking at here is, did Christ's work at Calvary accomplish something? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's one of the things that it accomplished? It bound Satan. Now, it didn't bind Satan for three and a half days. For three and a half days, it looked like Satan won, didn't it? 
But after three and a half days, when Christ rose, you know what the Scripture says He did? He made a show of them openly, spoiling them. Is Christ seated at the right hand today? Yes. When He desires to save one, does He save him? Can, Christ, uh, can Satan keep that from happening? No. All right, so then Satan is bound. And again, it's the same thing. But watch what we have again. Uh, it says, verse 13, When the dragon saw that he was cast under the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. He's been doing that all through this time, persecuting the church. And the church is sent out and nourished and kept, kept away from him. Verse 15, the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. You notice he didn't carry her away. He's trying to cause her to be carried away. Me and you have a phrase, say, I got carried away. What's that mean? I lost control. I lost control. I just got carried away with myself, right? Past where you were going. Yeah, you went past where you were In other words, I went too far. Look at all the doctrines that have come and what's happened to the church. The church has gotten carried away. Now he says next, the earth helped the woman and swallow, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood. I would suggest to you that those are professors and the people who work. Folks, false professors love all these doctrines and whatnot. I watched a, a thing not long ago with uh, Hagee, the fellow from Houston. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Hagee? Yeah. Yeah. All he does is talk about end time scenarios. Yeah. Has he ever predicted one right yet? No. You know, why are those people still following him? I'm not picking on them. They're carried away, aren't they? Yeah. He wrote that four blood moons. I, I, I laugh when I see it. I feel sorry for those people. I really do. But me and Lexi was in the thrift store and I always go to their book section and I'm looking and there's four blood moons. I started laughing. I thought that was his prediction for it. Y'all remember? That was it. There was these four special moons on special dates. Look out. You better look to Israel. Did it happen? No. no. Y'all know what he did the next Sunday? He went right on with something else. Charlie, they could go to, the, to us ignorant Christians and argue with us. We sure. can't say nothing about it. We don't know what we're talking about. If, if we're not equipped with the Scripture, we don't know. And they overcome us, don't they? Hey, that Hagee fella knows his teaching very well. And you get in an argument with him and he'll pound you down. And folks, if you can't win an argument with logic, how do they win it? They just get louder and louder. Look, I used to be guilty of this. I was taught all this, and I thought that's the way you go about it, but it's not. Okay, now, whenever we see Jesus Christ at throne, what can we expect? We can expect a long period of, of church growth, of the kingdom growing, going into the world. Did we have that in history? Yeah. yeah. Towards the end, what can we expect? Falling away. Falling away. Falling. A falling away. Now watch chapter 17. The dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Went to make war with the... What do we call this? Oh, verse it, verse. What did I say? Chapter I'm sorry, y'all. I hope I don't start that again today. Where we got to go? Uh, in Revelation 12, 17. The dragon was wroth with the woman. Now, why was he wroth with her? Because he couldn't overcome her. Folks, he, he made war against her and could not overcome her. What does persecution do in history to the church? Make it stronger. Makes it stronger. Y'all look at the church when it's persecuted. Y'all know why? All the dead weight takes off. All that. you got people that are sincere, don't you? But he says here, the, the Satan changes tactics. Verse 17, the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. What does that suggest all of a sudden? What's a remnant? Forest. The the it's a small group. It's the rest. What's happened to this great conquering church going in all the world? She's a remnant now. And it says to make war with her. Now, to make war. What do we call this final battle over here that he's mustering his troops for? Armageddon? And look, that, again, that's just an Old Testament reference to, to a battle. And we've got in the language of chapter 20, We've got, it's like under that battle that God led with the people of Magog. And I, I would suggest to y'all that's Antiochus Epiphanes based on what historians say, but it doesn't matter. All we're showing, we're showing is Satan has, is given back a certain power of deception and with that, what does he do? He attacks the church. Physically? No, physically he's never worked. Spiritually. And the church comes under attack and the church is surrounded. This happens on all the world and all the earth. Is everybody clear on that so far? Okay. Now, with that information, I want to show you all one more picture. Look, chapter 12 is the fourth vision. 
So in the fourth vision, we see the same time followed by a short time, don't we? Let's go back to the third vision in chapter 11. The third vision is part of chapter 11. And in this vision, it's the same thing. In verse 3, I will give power unto my two witnesses. Remember when the church went out, how they're sent out two by two. Two witnesses has to do with, with evangelism, testifying. And he tells us what the uh, candlesticks are. He, he says that's the churches. I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred three score day clothed in sackcloth. A thousand two hundred three score days is three and a half years, right? But it says, uh, these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. If any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. If any man will hurt them, he must be in this manner be killed. Physical fire? No. What's the power of God in, in the witness? The Word of God. Folks, if a person won't be converted by the Word of God, what's the Word of God going to do to them in judgment? judgment. It'll judge them and damn them. This is the fire of God. These have power, verse 6, to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. Now what's he talking about? He's talking about Elijah. This is reference to Elijah. I remember Elijah, God's people were dwindling down to a remnant, weren't they? He went out there and battled against that old rotten king and Jezebel. And what was Elijah armed with? Words. It's all he had. Words. But were they powerful? Elijah said, it ain't going to rain. And guess what? It didn't rain. Now, is this physically going to happen? What did God say comes down from above like rain? His doctrine. His teaching. Folks, the church has that teaching, don't they? Now, he goes on he says, uh, verse 7, when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit. If he ascends out of the bottomless pit, where was he to start with? In the bottomless pit. Now y'all think about it. When is Satan and, and this thing, when does all this have, have in Scripture we told that he's cast down? Back here. During this period of time, did the two witnesses go forth? The gospel goes into the world. Can Satan stop it? You realize the entire empire of Rome couldn't withstand Martin Luther? Y'all think on that for a minute. One man put a weapon on the Roman Empire, didn't he? I mean, they wanted to kill him and shut him up, could they? They couldn't stop him. Why? God was using him, folks. That was the man God was using. But it says after this period of time, something's going to happen. Now, we just told that this period of time is also likened unto three and a half years years. In other words, it's not complete. It's a set time. It has a limit set to it. It's an incomplete period of time. But watch what happens. It's verse 7. When they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of a bottomless pit shall make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. Ain't that exactly what we just read in chapter 20? During the little season? Ain't it what we read in the... Yeah, now watch what it says. Their dead body shall lie in the street of that great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt. That's this world where also our Lord was crucified. Look, it's not that you can't find a church anywhere. They're on every corner, aren't they? But you know what a lot of them are lying on those corners like? Dead bodies. Are they testifying of anything? No, so they're not preaching the gospel. Then he says next, They of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. Now, three and a half years is this period of time. Well, what's he call this little season? Three and a half days. Well, what's three and a half days compared to three and a half years? It's small. It's a short duration of time. Folks, the picture here is very plain. Watch what happens next. Verse 11. After three days... Well, let's read 10. Y'all tell me if this sounds like listening to the news today or Facebook. They that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them, the dead church, and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets, the church preaching the gospel, tormented them that dwelt on the earth. Folks, do they love to see Christianity trying to do They do. I mean, y'all look at how they're... Y'all know they're burning Bibles in Portland? I don't watch the news, but a friend Maurice said, hey, have you seen this? I looked, and I clicked on look. Sure enough, they're burning Bibles in Portland in that riot. What's the Bible got to do with 
You see the real intentions coming out. I don't mean all the people that are that are protesting and all the cities hate God. I don't mean that. I mean there are people behind this and powers behind this that are manipulating them and they're being used and they don't even know it. What's the real authority behind them want to do? Stop the witness of the church. And folks, it ain't got nothing to do with in Portland. The truth is the power behind it has nothing to do with white life, black life, yellow life. They don't care. It has to do with their, their power and their authority in the devil. So now they're burning Bibles. Do y'all think that's going to be the end of it? Yeah. If God don't come back, that's where we're headed, didn't it? Is this the first time this has ever happened? No. No. We saw what Hitler did, didn't we? Yeah. Come burn your books, right? Alright, now, it says, verse 11, after three days and a half in which they look dead, right? The little period of time when the church looks dead, the Spirit of life from God entered into them and they stood upon their feet and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud and their enemies beheld them. Does that sound like resurrection? Yes. After three and a half days? Let's do it this way. Jesus Christ had His ministry on earth. From the time He started, how long is His ministry? Three and a half years. Three and a half years. Could Satan do anything about it? No. No. Folks, Satan couldn't even hold a, a, a... He couldn't even keep someone possessed of a devil, could he? Matter of fact, as soon as Christ wins His victory over Satan when He was tempted, right after His baptism, He's tempted. He proves He has authority and power over the devil, doesn't He? And what's He immediately start doing? Casting out devils, healing disease. Could Satan keep somebody blind? When Christ said, stand up, what did they do? Stand when up. Christ told the apostles, follow me. Have y'all ever thought about that? How logical is it that Matthew's sitting there at a table, getting rich, collecting taxes, and a stranger walks by, looks at him and says, follow me, and he gets up and leaves it all and follows him. Is that normal? No. That's the effectual call of God, isn't it? And so what does it show you? Jesus Christ is going to spoil Satan's kingdom and take what he desires, isn't he? And does he begin doing that? Yeah. From the very beginning, they want to kill him, don't they? They try and kill him, could they? His time wasn't yet. But finally, does it appear that Satan wins? Yeah. It appears so. How long does it seem like Satan won? Three and a half days. And at the end of the three and a half days, what happened? Up from the grave, he arose. Folks, this is what's going to happen with the church. So Satan don't get this straight. Satan's really losing gradually. He is. He's losing gradually, and literally, if we stood back, what we would see is God's allowing him to amass. You know, if you watch World War II, and I guess it happens in every war, but I, just World War II is the only one I'm really familiar with. But the, the the team that's losing finally says puts all their eggs in one basket and makes one final assault, don't they? And that's what Hitler did, isn't it? Y'all remember Hitler took his trend, just made one final assault. Well, that's all God's doing. He's allowing Satan to gather his troops for one final assault. We're living in it. It's a spiritual assault. And folks, we're under assault today like we've never been. For what? For believing yeah. this book and the one that wrote it. What's the world tell you? Oh, you're crazy. You're nuts. You can't believe that book, can you? Uh, uh, a man told me one time in these exact words, you don't honestly believe that book, do you? And it was about evolution. I said, well, where'd you get evolution? He said, well, Charles Darwin. I said, you met Charles Darwin? He said, no. Have not you read The Origin of Species? Huh? I started laughing. Wait a minute. <laughs> you putting your faith in that book, aren't you? This is, this is a simple concept. So basically what we're seeing here in all these visions is we're seeing the same thing. Now I want to see, I want to show y'all that the Apostle Paul explains the same thing. Exactly. Go to 2 Thessalonians. Go to 2 Thessalonians 1 first. By the way, the binding of Satan. Everything that has to do with the binding of Satan was associated with the first coming of Christ, wasn't it? Folks, it ain't got nothing to do with the second coming. At the second coming, Satan is destroyed. Not bound, destroyed. Now, in 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 1, let's start in verse 4. Paul says to these people, 
Hey, by the way, the Thessalonians are kind of unique. This is one of the earliest letters Paul wrote to these people, first and second. I would suggest to you Galatians was first. But anyway, he went there, and in the first letter, he talks to them about the resurrection, doesn't he? He tells them what it's going to be like. By the time he writes the second letter, somebody has pulled the wool over their eyes and is kind of confusing them. In this letter, he addresses this. But in verse 5, he said, or 4, so that we ourselves glory in you, in the churches of God, for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. Was the Thessalonian church going through persecution and tribulation? Yeah. yeah. He says, 5, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which ye also suffer. They're suffering for the kingdom. How are they going to suffer for a kingdom that didn't exist yet? They're citizens yeah, of the so. kingdom, and yeah. as such, they're under attack, aren't they? Yeah, so verse 6, Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. So the world puts the church through tribulation and persecutes the church. God uses that for our benefit, chastising, strengthening, and building us up. What's He going to do with the persecutors? Mm -hmm. Judge them and condemn them. So He says now in verse 7, And to you who are troubled, rest with us. By the way, when will God judge them and give them their just due? At the second coming. Or what about me and you? And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with His mighty angels in flaming fire. How's He coming? In flaming fire. Flaming fire. Now, I, I have no idea how physical this will be. I don't understand anything about it. I have a friend that's a, a chemical engineer and he'll tell you some things about elements that it's above my head, but you know, you reach a certain temperature and the elements revert back to basically hydrogen. And everything goes back to water, basically, like we started back there in the beginning of Genesis. But when it says he's coming in flaming fire, is he coming in judgment? Mm -hmm. Is anybody going to escape? No. no. Folks, is any flesh going to make it through this? No. Mm -hmm. no. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, then is the gospel still going to be preached at the second coming? Yes. Right until the coming. Is there going to be any period of seven years where another gospel is going to be preached? Yes. Is there going to be any period where anything changes? All right, now he says next, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. When? When is this destruction going to take place? Now, who are we talking about here? Men with the mark. Aren't that those that wouldn't worship the Lord? Yeah. Yeah. And are we told, we've already read in Revelation a vision where they're destroyed at the second coming, aren't we? When is their judgment? At the second coming. That's when the judgment takes place. But watch the same thing. At the same time, verse 10, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe. Now skip the parentheses. In that day. In those days? No. In that day. What day? The last, the last day. day. The Lord speaks over and over about the resurrection and the judgment on the last day, doesn't he? Okay, does everybody see that picture so far? Now let's read one more. He says, verse 11, Wherefore, since that's what's coming, also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of His goodness and of the work of faith with power. Then is the tribulation working on our faith. He says that that faith is like gold put into a furnace. What's a furnace do to gold? It purifies. It purifies it. It's got a lot of impurities to cook out, doesn't it? He, I, I tend to think of finding gold like... Me and Lexi watched a John Wayne movie the other day from 1931, I think. He, he looked about 25. And they went out there and he picked up two big old gold rocks. Didn't he, Lexi? Boy, look at there. I think that's gold. We hit it rich. Is that how they really find gold generally? The, the most gold they find it, it's in ore and it's in veins. What do they have to do with it? They, first thing they have to do is put it in a, in a punch. They crush it, don't they? And they pound it and they get and then what do they do? Then they get all the rocks and the big stuff out and they keep going and they put it in a fire. That's what God does with our faith. Now they, those that he uses, what about them? They're being used. Like Nebuchadnezzar was used to judge Israel, and then what did God to do? Turn around and judge Nebuchadnezzar, didn't he? So it's the same picture. But now come to chapter two. Now we beseech you, brethren. 
by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto Him. So what's the subject matter? The coming of the Lord and our gathering to Him. That you be not soon shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter as from us. Is there a spirit today troubling people about this? You better believe it. How about men with letters and words? Mm -hmm. Well, Darby's troubled a lot of people, hadn't he? Schofield and Larkin with those charts and all those things. Folks, they've troubled a lot. And I don't mean, I'm not telling y'all the men were lost. I'm telling you uh, great deceptions happened. He says, as at that the day of Christ is at hand. Now, when did Paul write this letter? Way back here, he's writing to the Thessalonians, right? And what's he telling? The day of Christ is not at hand. Don't fret and worry as if you, that day is upon you, or in another case, you've missed it, as some people were telling him. He says, Let no man deceive you by any means. Now, did God take a, a, a means of deception from the devil? Did he give him that power back? And what has happened in the last 200 years? Great deception. Y'all know what they invented about 190 years ago? They invented another resurrection. They invented another judgment. And that was followed by a third resurrection and a third judgment. They invented a secret resurrection here. Hey, Y'all familiar with all of this? Where did all this come from? It's not in that book. Now he says next, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day, the day of Christ, shall not come, except there come a falling away first. Now, a falling away is the word apostasy in Greek. Paul said, look, before he comes back, there's going to be a great apostasy, right? He says, the falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. So he says, in, in the first century back here, he said, look, there's some things that have got to happen. Did Paul know the date of the second coming? No. no, no man knows that. But Paul said, we do know a couple things. Number one, there's going to be a great falling away. That hadn't happened yet. He said, number two, there's that other ruler, that man of sin that's going to come. Paul was dealing with Caesar, wasn't he? But did Paul know there was one coming after Caesar? There's another throne to come, isn't there? Now watch what this new throne's going to do. He says, verse uh, 4, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God. All the Caesars did that, didn't they? He says, Or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. He said there's another ruler yet to come that hadn't rose up yet. And I don't mean one man. I mean a king, a kingdom. He said, and this one's going to be unique. This one's going to take place. It's going to begin in the church itself. Now, did this ever happen? Sure did. It began to happen in Rome a long time ago. Did a man rise up and begin to say he was king of the earth? Mm -hmm. did, he, did, he, did he do what follows? Watch verse 5. Remember ye that when I was yet with you, I told you these things, and now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Paul said, look, it's already working, but it hadn't come to fruition. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way, and then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. So is this ruler going to be around when Christ comes? Sure. He says, Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Now did Caesar perform any false miracles? No. no Caesar ruled with an iron fist. This man here is going to deceive. He's going to rule over people with signs and wonders and false miracles. Y'all think of anybody? Hey, turn on TBN. You can see men doing it right now, can't you? But it all started with a different man. Now, verse 10. With all deceivableness of unrighteousness, in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. For this cause God shall send them strong delusion. Where are we at right now? Strong. Little season. Strong delusion that they all might believe a lie. Why are they going to believe the lie? Because they wouldn't believe the truth. You see how this all just keeps matching, doesn't it? All right, do y'all have any questions about the way this time lays out? Okay, well, let's take a break.